We need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future. Welcome, everybody. It's um, John McDonnell. Um, I'm wearing these ludicrous headphones because my microphone is playing up at the moment, so there's a bit of feedback, but apologies for that. Let me explain the background to this discussion. Um, last year, when the pandemic was beginning to well, kick off, really, around about April, May, when it was really beginning to hit hard, um, there was a, a great deal of discussion about the issues that we face, the crisis that we faced as a result of the pandemic, the issues that we had to address, the policies that we had to pursue, and how we could maybe try and shape some of the responses in local communities and nationally to what the pandemic was uh, wreaking in terms of the damages to our society. But during those initial discussions, there was also a, a discussion about or well, should we be planning now for the sort of society that we want at, at the end of the pandemic, as we come through the pandemic? There was a lot of sloganeering around build back better, and there still is. As quite a number of us thought, well, actually, we don't want to build back. We don't want to go back at all. And what we want to do is we want to look at the future. We want to actually claim the future for ourselves. And there was that comparison about, well, Boris Johnson was trying to portray himself as Winston Churchill, all these Second World War illusions. And some of us said, actually, if the real lesson in the Second World War was that even in the depths of the darkest period of that war, progressives and socialists came together to talk about the sort of future that they wanted. They looked back on the 1930s and they said never again. And they looked at the lessons from the 1930s about the nature of the society that they wanted to build. And it was about, first of all, yes, it was talking, dreaming, but then planning the society. The result of that was the Atli government and the welfare state. Um, that Who's thinking hegemonize political debate for the next 25, 30 years, a whole generation. Unfortunately, that hegemony was broken down by Thatcher and we we saw the emergence of neoliberalism, its dominance in terms of political discussion across political parties that even penetrated the Labour Party as well. It was based upon concepts of individualism, making sure that in some ways, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog law of the jungle society that was being created. Profit became everything, the main motivation for companies and shareholders. Privatisation ran apace. And we saw the whittling away of the role of the state and savage attacks on working class people, their living standards and quality of life. A generation in the 1980s into the 90s of young people with no jobs and no future. Unfortunately, some of that did penetrate the Labour Party, but nevertheless, um, we're now in a situation where after 11 years of austerity, we now know that those 11 years ill prepared us for the pandemic, 100,000 vacancies in the NHS and in social care, high levels of inequality and deprivation, financial insecurity for many families as soon as they lost their jobs or even when they're furloughed with wage cuts. So it was about now that we'd already seen some challenges to the dominance of neoliberalism with alternatives being put forward, particularly through the Labour manifestos of 2017 and 2019. But we needed now to talk about what what sort of society do we want after the as we emerge from the pandemic, learning the lessons of the last generation, learning the lessons in particular the last 11 years of austerity, 
but also learning the lessons of what we discovered about ourselves in the pandemic as well and what came out of that it was an understanding that we cared for each other we needed each other so a new set of principles are beginning to emerge ones which are based upon a sense of community a sense of real value real social value rather than a person's value being determined by the market in addition to that the need for a recognition that we needed some well, universal basic services that provide us all with a decent quality of life and that they should be provided by the state so free health free care free education decent housing and yes ensuring that people had a decent jobs with you know, real wages but in addition to that a guarantee of an income when they are unable to work and also making sure that people had a quality of life i suppose which could be sustained because we now know as we move from one pandemic crisis we go into another which is the existential threat of climate change so there are many of us believe that actually we are on the edge of that paradigm change and that there is now real potential despite how tough it is at the moment there's real potential for that change in society and so we brought together last year and there was 9 months 10 months of work of bringing together policy experts campaigners and people with interest in particular specialist subjects set up a series of panels and those panel discussions took place online people drafted papers and we published them on the claim the future website we called this project claim the future because we as i said we didn't want to build back we wanted to claim the future for ourselves and for a different type of society we put those policy papers on the website and we wrapped that all up in one pamphlet a summary pamphlet please go on the website and have a look at it see what you think but we're now in a situation where things have moved on and we need to start talking i think very specifically about what's happening in individual communities and how do we take some of those policy ideas and nourish them in the coming in the coming period with further detailed discussion and a number of those ideas were fairly straightforward really you know that everyone should have a minimum income guarantee everybody should have a guaranteed job everyone should have a free education free healthcare free social care and in addition to that we've got to recognize now that we live in a society that should be properly connected and that means yes free broadband it also means that every decision that we take now has to be based upon the risk of climate change and therefore every decision has to contribute towards creating a sustainable environment so there was a number of those ideas that we we discussed that was based upon recognizing that to afford all these things we need a we need a fair taxation system and we needed to ensure that we recognize that in addition to what we wanted in our own individual communities and nationally we play an international role as well so therefore it was about making sure that we were working with our colleagues in the global south to address all of those issues that have res- created the crises that they face as a result of yes colonialism and neo colonialism over the last two centuries and the united kingdom had a particular role in that because of the role of the uk as we know as a result of the black lives matter campaign our role in slavery but also in terms of our role of as a finance sector a global finance sector which was extracting the wealth of the global south and profiteering from it whilst impoverishing millions and generations of people there so we looked at all those ideas and we put them together and now what we're looking at is how do we go for, further forward on this and i think most of it now is about local action local discussions around key priorities within particular communities building that sense of community but by addressing the key issues that that people face within their communities and it is a way in which we can then build solidarity of course that requires government change and as a labor mp i want to ensure that we have a labor government at the next election but it must be a labor government that's based upon the yes of course the radical policies from the manifestos of 2017 and 2019 but actually we need to be much more radical now because the crises that we face is so much more serious 
So that's why the, the, these we're hosting these discussions um, under the auspices of Claim the Future. It's not a new organization. It's just a way in which we, we network. It's the old concept of praxis, really, where you put together theory and practice. So we were bringing together theoreticians and policy experts, but also with people who are campaigning and working on the ground. So today um, we asked Zara Sultana, would she like to host a discussion uh, under the auspices of Claim the Future, specifically with regard to Coventry and her constituency? We've done this in a number of other constituencies and it's nourished our whole debate and discussion about how we go forward. One of the key issues that we now have to address is that the Labour Party has launched a policy review and that policy review will be the mechanism by which the Labour Party considers its policies and policy programme for the next general election, the next manifesto. The key issue for us is to make sure that manifesto really does address the key issues that our community is facing. Yes, building upon 2017 and 2019 manifestos, but as I say, I think the the nature of the crisis that we now face, particularly on climate change, and some of the social crises that we face, particularly in issues like housing and health and education, our public services overall, it needs much more radical endeavour than even the last two Labour manifestos. And so some of our work will be feeding into that policy review um, with the ambition of creating an unstoppable climate of opinion that supports radical policy making and which the Labour Party then will take in, into government. That's the nature of the discussion. So today, um, we've asked whether Zara could set the scene in terms of the issues facing her constituency and how she sees the way forward. And then we want to address two of the key issues that are facing all of us, but in every community. One is the housing crisis, and the second is the climate crisis, the existential threat of climate change that we all face and have to address. So I'm really pleased. I'm just going to invite Zara to set the scene for us in, in these discussions. Over to you, Zara. Thank you so much, John, um, for that introduction. I want to thank John and his team at Claim the Future for organising today's event and virtually joining us in Coventry. As you all know, and as I knew before I was elected to Parliament, John has always been a fearless principal champion of socialism and social justice, someone I've always looked up to. But getting elected, I've seen also what a kind, considerate colleague he is, helping me and the new intake of MPs understand the weird world of Parliament and helping us have that confidence to speak out. So thank you for everything that you've done and that you continue to do, John. Another thing that John introduced me to was um, a concept that I want to quickly mention from the outset. It's the name for when wealthy few, the wealthy few act with no regard for the people, when the indifference of their class causes death and misery for our class. John used it in relation to the Grenfell Tower fire and he was absolutely right to. The concept is social murder. And in this pandemic, that's what this Tory government is again responsible for. And that's why Matt Hancock must go. He discharged people into care homes without testing. He sent NHS workers to the front line without PPE. He handed COVID, COVID contracts to his Tory mates. And he spent £37 billion on a privatised test and trace system that doesn't even work. Because of these actions and because of the choices of this Tory government, tens of thousands of people, disproportionately working class people, have died and they didn't need to die. So Hancock is responsible. And, you know, if he happens to be watching this, who knows? Um, it's time for you to go, Matt. Today, our focus is the future of Coventry and how we decarbonize and provide good homes for all. I just want to give a sense of the challenges we face. This week, it was revealed that in the past 12 months, oil and gas donors gave more than £400,000 to the Conservative Party. These donations were given up, um, given to the government in the run-up to making a decision on new fossil fuel licences for the North Sea. Another major source of donations to the Conservative Party are also property developers and construction big businesses who donated £11 million to Boris Johnson in his first year in office and we know that these donations from fossil fuel companies and property developers 
aren't because they're just generous and they just feel good and that's why they're doing it. That's not how they got rich in the first place. And they're making these donations to get something in return. So what did the government do about the North Sea licenses? Well, they went ahead with them and they granted licenses for projects worth £16 billion. And in, in the week that's just gone in Parliament, on a vote to rein in the powers of property developers, what did the Tories do on that? Well, of course, they refused to back the plans and again, let big business run the roost. I want to highlight these points, whether it's on climate or housing, because there will be no justice unless we stand up to fossil fuel billionaires and super rich property developers, because our interests are not aligned. Their interests are not ours. And we will only decarbonize our economy and provide good homes for all by taking these people on, by putting people and the planet before profits. So I'm very clear, um, the deeper the crises we face from the pandemic to poverty and inequality, from the climate emergency to the housing crisis, these crises are only getting deeper and the need for radical policies is only getting greater. That's what I'm championing for in Coventry and in the country. It's a people's Green New Deal. And what are we talking about when we say that? Well, it's a program of economic transformation that combats social injustice and the climate emergency. It invests in green technology, in green infrastructure and services, and it creates more than a million well-paid unionized jobs. It brings into industries, brings industries into public ownership and it gives key workers a pay rise that they deserve. And we have to do this while taking on the super rich and big business by making them pay their fair share because they are not paying their fair share. This program really can revitalize industries in Coventry across the West Midlands and the country by creating those good union jobs. And we're talking about training up workers from everything from building electric buses and free railways to solar panels, and wind turbines, investing in low carbon, green jobs like social care, as well as insulating our homes where we can cut emissions and bills. And that's what is so important for me to be pushing in Parliament and in Coventry. And we've seen things like the proposed Gigafactory on the airport site, as well as Coventry Green New Deal's campaign to retrofit all homes. And just like that campaign demonstrates, the climate emergency and the housing crisis aren't two separate things. We have to tackle them both together. We can cut rents and we can improve living standards and we can cut emissions by providing everyone with a good, genuinely affordable, low carbon home. And that's why one of the most exciting proposals that the Labour Party had in its previous two manifestos was building the biggest council house building programme in generations. And that's good quality, well insulated homes to get rid of private landlords who are scamming people and reducing carbon. So in Coventry, locally and nationally in Parliament, we need to be building up a movement that can sweep the Tories from power, that can transform Coventry and the country. It's the future that we desperately need because the alternative, there is no real alternative to this. It's the future that we also deserve. So I look forward to fighting for that with you all. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing the rest of the panel and, and questions that people have for us. Thanks, thanks Zara. Thanks. Um, Zara was complimenting me for some bizarre reason when she introduced it all. Uh, let me... <laughs> I don't know whether people have followed her speeches in Parliament. But they've been some of the most eloquent I've heard from day one. But also, I measure these speeches always on the basis of the scale of opposition from the Tories on the other side. And Zara has been attending rather than um, undertaking the work virtually. And she does that because she's my proxy vote along with many other Labour MPs. So I'd like to thank her for that. But what I enjoy is listening to the Tories who are in the chamber baying at her when she's speaking. And I think that's a measure of how effective she is. <laughs> so, sorry. The speech, keep doing the speeches. They're not, they're just not, they're not so, 
it's it's that they're, they're so poignant, I think, and so meaningful, and so actually you you do them in such a style that demonstrates true emotion. That's what really gets the to under the Tories' skin, and obviously you use undeniable facts. That's it. So I'm just so pleased you're there. It's, it's watching the new generation that's come into Parliament this time round has just been fantastic. Uh, we've got some questions coming in that we'll deal with later. Um, some of them I find hilarious. Can I just mention one? Anne Maria said she's never. While well, Starmer's still leader at the next general election, she'll never be voting Labour for the first time in over 50 years. Anne-Marie, I, I can understand how strongly you feel, but I have to say that it's a bizarre thing to say that just because the leader of the Labour Party is annoying you, that you'll then not vote and allow the Tories to get in. The bet On all these things, I've, you know, Jeremy and I were on the back benches for God knows how many years, lone voices at times, and we stuck in and we fought, and eventually we got a socialist leader of the Labour Party. That will happen again, but it will only happen again if people fight from within the Labour Party and not give up on it. And if if there's any hope for the Labour Party in the future, Anne-Marie, I think it's going to be based upon people like you sticking around and supporting us. OK, let's go on to our next speaker. One of the key issues that we face is this housing crisis. Zara's honed in on it, but, uh, both in terms of what we need to do in terms of building. She's also challenged um, the Tories about their links with developers in Parliament the other week. Um, she did it brutally. It was superb. She just demonstrated the corruption that's involved, uh, this link between the Tories and developers, the political donations. If you get a chance to see, listen to Zara's speech, go, go on to the parliamentary website. It's excellent. But one of the issues as well is what do we do with housing immediately now? There's a large number of renters out there that are being hit with high increases in rents. In addition to that, the threat of evictions as well. And also, in addition to that, sometimes rogue landlords, in many instances, not maintain their properties. Well, what's been brilliant about this recent period is that we've now got renters' unions, renters' organisations coming together. And one of the key ones that I, I just think has been the, one of the most successful and one of the best initiatives I've seen in recent years is the development of ACORN, the housing campaigning organisation, which has bring rent, brought renters together and mobilise their collective strength. So we've got Annabelle Davis from ACORN to talk to us about the organisation. Thanks, Annabelle. Thanks, John, for the uh, the compliment and the welcome. Um, so I'm Annabelle, I'm the chair of ACORN Coventry. Um, I've been involved in ACORN for almost a year now. Um, and what ACORN is, is a mass membership organisation and a network of low-income people who organise for a fairer deal for our communities. It was founded in Bristol in 2014. And um, while it's an international organisation, in the UK it started as a few local residents trying to tackle slum housing in their neighbourhood. And then it quickly developed into a national organisation. It's got thousands of members, groups, um, dozens of groups and branches across England and Wales. So ACORN's made up of members who are from low and middle income households, renters, workers, pensioners and students, all working class people who are just fighting for a better life in their communities. And we're also a multi-issue organisation. So we've organised successful, successful campaigns around housing, transport, economic justice and democratic engagement. So ACORN Coventry launched with a handful of members in April 2020 during the COVID pandemic and throughout a year full of lockdowns we've managed to grow to just over 50 due paying members who are active in our group. The first actions we did were to take part in ACORN's Housing is Health campaign. Um, in this we successfully put pressure on the government with our groups and branches across, across the country to demand an extension to the eviction ban over lockdown. It was an especially important campaign um, in Coventry as 22% of housing is privately rented and tenants in Coventry are more unhappy with their landlords than any other city in the Midlands. We've had a long hard fought campaign for a student who was stuck in a contract for a flat she wasn't using due to the pandemic. And this gained us a lot of notoriety and the support um, of Zara Sultana and her office. 
Since then, we've supported uh, member impression their landlords to complete much ignored repair work. And we've also spent time growing our membership. And one important thing uh, that we also do is upskill and train the members that we have. Uh, Acorn Country has currently got two member defence cases and they both look at housing issues. So one's an unfair rent increase and the other one is a withheld deposit and really terrible treatment of a tenant, which I'll discuss a bit more later. And we're looking to start expanding our cases to more community issues and more campaigning issues as we grow bigger. And to link this in to claim the future, um, what Acorn believes is that uh, inequality and social problems are all about power. So the only way we'll see meaningful action is if we can counter the power of money and establishment politics with the power of people taking collective action. Everyone has the right to a place at the table and ACORN puts community organisation at the heart of the fight for economic and social justice. We hear every day about these issues that our communities are facing, rising housing costs, stagnant wages and brutal cuts that have starved our public services. And the bottom line is that we think that well, we believe that wealth is being transferred upwards and the only solution for this um, is for people to get organised and win it back. So our platform, um, and there'll be a link sent in the chat, it sets out the guiding beliefs behind what we do and it can be found on our website. It was put together by our members at last year's conference and it, uh, sorry, um, I don't have time to go into it, but it's really worth checking out if you want to know more about what ACORN does and how we achieve what we do. Um, and what all this boils down to is the fact that we are a direct action organisation like Claim the Future and John and Zara have discussed. So we take the view that organising with the people affected by an issue in a way that allows them to confront decision makers directly is the best way for them to win material changes for themselves and their communities. So how do we win these battles? We practice this direct action within two main aspects of our work, campaign and member defence. So our campaigns focus on wider material change um, and these are on a local or national level. It might be a working class area of Sheffield who's having their bin collection neglected or people on disability benefits who are discriminated against due to um, crooked landlord mortgage lending policies of big banks. And both of these are things we've run campaigns on. Coventry Acorn is currently considering a long-term campaign for comprehensive landlord licensing. There's been wins for this in Oxford and Sheffield who achieved council commitment quite recently. But a few years ago when this was proposed in Coventry, um, it got voted down by the Labour Council. And we'd ask anyone who's a Labour representative or a representative of, of any other political party to send us an email um, that we'll send the link to the chat and uh, we'd ask you to sign a pledge if, uh, if it's something that you would support us in. We've also more recently taken part in Kill the Bill campaigns nationally and locally. We held a demo in Broadgate and we also took part in the Housing is Health campaign as I discussed earlier. So our member defence efforts are focused on individual members um, and these often looks like, look like disputes between tenants and landlords, stolen deposits, disrepair, harassment or illegal eviction. And we take these issues that are felt by individuals, but we collectivise them. And it points to the way that housing is structured in Britain as independ independent renters often struggle against the structural issues. So this has really taken place in Coventry through the case of a member who was left homeless and suffered two miscarriages after being harassed and charged uh, falsely for non-existent repairs. In a defence, we've delivered letters to the landlady, the letting agents, we've picketed the letting agency, we've delivered our demands for them to apologise and drop the charges, carried out phone blockades and review bombed them. And we're now carrying out another letter writing campaign to the landlady. Um, you can find more about this on the ACON platform, but I'll list a few other achievements across the nation. So we organised in Park Hill Flats in Sheffield to oppose a fuel poverty inducing heat in charge hike. And this won a review of the hike as well as, as well as a refund for tenants. There's also the Manchester bus campaign, uh, which saw local authority regulation reintroduced and has given the local authority planning powers over the services 
which means the buses actually serve their communities, they're more integrated, more affordable, more accessible and more reliable. And this was being ignored by the profit hungry, hungry companies that were allowed to do what they wanted before. In 2018, we had a joint national action against NatWest and the TSB group, and this forced them to drop clauses in their mortgage lending policies that discourage landlords from renting to tenants on disability benefits. And we've also set up eviction resistance networks for when the eviction ban is lifted. So we have trained members who will keep tenants in their homes and stop unjust evictions. But beyond this, uh, it all reflects how instead of individual wins and achievements, it's the collective direct action. And all of these things take power back. In a lot of cities, ACORN, uh, the name gets mentioned and landlords are very quick to actually do what we want them to do. So we are a membership organization, uh, kind of like trade unions are in the workplace and it gives members ownership over the organization. There's democrat democratic votes at all decision-making levels from local to national and it prevents us from relying on any form of influential big funders. We gain our membership through extensive door knocking and outreach efforts by both members and organizers when it's safe to do so. And on a national level, we have coordinated autonomy. So we have local decision making at branch and group level. And these are guided by the aims and principles of the platform that was mentioned earlier. Uh, at the moment, there's 25 branches and groups right across England and Wales from large cities to small towns and everything in between. So there's obviously a group in Coventry, big cities like Bristol, Manchester and Sheffield where Acorn started. But the more recent group uh, has been established in Aberystwyth and that's a very rural Welsh town with a population of less than 20,000 people. So we've got the organisational strength now and we're doing the very important task of organising everywhere that we can. Uh, as a result, there's a long list of people looking to launch groups across England and Wales, and it's something we're looking to do across 2021. Um, if you would like to join ACORN or learn some more information, I'll send a link into the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to answering any questions. Thanks, Annabelle. That was terrific. Um, some of the discussion that goes on in the chat and elsewhere is about the future strategy. We'll come back to that. Um, but on the housing front, it's a classic example of where we're at at the moment, is that with the Tories with an 80 seat majority in Parliament, it's virtually impossible to win anything in Parliament to, in any form of progressive cause, let's put it that way. So therefore, the the way in which we defend and promote the interests of working people has to be outside of Parliament, and it has to be through organisations like ACORN. And so we may not be able to win votes, but what we can do is ensure that we take direct action in the way that ACORN is doing. And that direct action is a combination of street work, of course, but also targeted direct action against those individuals or companies or agencies that are ex basically exploiting working people. But the other thing that ACON does, that I think, as Anne Maria set out, which I think is just reinforces the role, is being incredibly professional about the nature of the advice and the information that they give to people. So you feel confident when you when you've been briefed by ACON about a particular issue in your patch or a case, you feel absolutely confident. And it's that sort of sometimes on the left we don't properly recognise or acknowledge it, but that real depth of knowledge and understanding empathy of course but how you put all that together i think is a real art form and that's from my experience that's what acorn has done thanks annabelle that was terrific we'll come back there'll be questions we'll come back to okay um our next speaker is tom maidment from commentary for a green new deal um zara has mentioned it and it's become one of zara's central campaigns about um, climate change and how we tackle that existential crisis but then also the practical examples of what you do on the ground and that is the rollout of the detail of the Green New Deal and how we can inspire people about that and, and how we can mobilize across the movement. So it's over to you Tom, I think you're having problems with your camera are you? Yep, um, sorry. Oh. So you're not going to be able to see my face, but I promise. There is one. <laughs> That's all right. Some people wish they weren't seeing mine, but don't worry. Go on. 
press on. So, uh, Coventry Green New Deal, uh, we started a, a few years ago with a, a public meeting uh, in which particularly, uh, I think a lot of people were catalyzed by the fact that our uh, councillor, cabinet member with uh, responsibility for climate change essentially said uh, the, the words that, that Coventry could not decarbonize. He was making a point about how Coventry is relatively small compared to much bigger places, but it, it did not go down well. And I think it really catalyzed us as a group. Um, but uh, so we're affiliated with the, uh, the Green New Deal UK, which is the logo you can see, but also with Labour for a Green New Deal nationally. But we are sort of nominally independent of those, um, although we sort of share resource with them. Um, we're a group of, of, of activists in Coventry with a, a real range of skills. And, and if you want to get involved, I'll give you details at the end to, to um, if you want to get involved. Um, so we, we have a group, a really good group of skills amongst the activists we have. Um, we've got people who with uh, experience in organising, experience in community organising, in, in union organising. Uh, we've got sustainability engineers and we've got one guy who's been uh, involved in the COP process since the very first one in 1992. And we've got councillors, uh, we've got uh, the MPs involved um, and, and we've got a lot of normal people who, who are experts in their communities because of the communities they live in. Um, and we're really looking to build that green and more socially just Coventry because we can decarbonize really badly and that's often what the conservatives are doing at the moment um which is by making some rich people very rich but largely making um the vast majority of people's lives worse um you know the, be the best way to decarbonize is by crashing the economy and putting a huge number of people destitute and shutting down all the factories it's really effective um but it's not a really good way of doing it um you you look at um We've, we've done some normal stuff. Um, no, I'm going to go for that example. If you look at uh, Thatcher's closure of all the coal mines and all the coal power plants, it was a really good way of decarbonizing uh, the, the economy. It was really effective at that, but it was absolutely terrible for all the people. And that's not how we want to do it. We want to do it so that all those people get reskilled, get proper, proper better jobs, um, unionized jobs. And that's really our ethos uh, as, a, as a group. Um, so we, we obviously do a lot of pushing the council to go further and faster. We've got a Labour council in Coventry, um, but sometimes they do need a little push. Um, sometimes they need quite a hard little push. Um, we've worked with Unite quite a lot. Um, we've firstly started with uh, working on taxis. So uh, we have black cabs in Coventry, black cabs, the new black cabs, well, the old black cabs as well. Um, but we're built in Coventry and, and have been since black cabs uh, were first used uh, with a, an engine. Uh, and so we're working with the, the taxi drivers in Coventry to kind of build a way of transitioning them from um, the very dirty old ones to, to the new electric um, cabs. We've really struggled with that around particularly the Uber challenge. Um, black cab drivers really make a very poor wage and they're only slowly recovering. So we've been working with the council to try and get them to guarantee uh, some uh, contracts for the black cab drivers so that we can build that transition uh, and work with them to, to soften that blow of just saying from 2022 your old black cabs are not going to be usable and um, we've come up with some things that, that have been taken forward uh, by Unite to, to negotiate how, how that can uh, be done and we're also working with the Unite and, and the stewards uh, and, and staff from a, a large aerospace um, employer in the city uh, to get a Green New Deal, um, to really diversify what they do away maybe from just aerospace um, so that that perhaps dying industry or, or that, that industry that is unlikely to rebound for a long time and perhaps is unlikely to uh, improve in the next few years um, can be the, 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 the incredible skills. These guys are unbelievably precise welders better than pretty much any robot can do um they're amazing machinists and those skills can be reused um and we don't want those skills just to get dispersed and destroyed and, and um one of the councillors has a really good example about a lot of the the industry that exists in commentary around ge and the car industry uh, to a slightly lesser extent is that got dispersed after the, those companies close and, and that nucleus of expertise is, is wasted and a lot of those people who had an incredibly high precision skill have almost had to drop down to a less precision skill um, to do a similar job 
and to, to apply their skills. So it's taking those people with us and building a just transition by diversifying what those companies do, because those skills can just as well be applied to hydrogen infrastructure, to nuclear infrastructure, to uh, gearboxes for wind turbines, to heat pumps and those sorts of things. And we're now working with not just a group in Coventry, but also a group in Lancashire and a group in Glasgow to understand how we can um, get a just transition for those groups. And, and we're, we're running some um, workshops with them, uh, with the you know, union members led by the union members to develop a worker-led transition similar to the Lucas plan, um, but hopefully success, more successful. Um, and we're working with not just, because workers look different now than perhaps they did uh, in the 80s, there's more computers. So a machinist today is a computer. So we're, we're making sure that we are not just working with the um, shop floor workers, but we're also working with the design engineers um, and uh, all the different types of, of, of members of, of Unite and, and the other unions to ensure that everyone is taken on that journey, not just the shop floor. Um, but the other thing, that, the thing that perhaps is more interesting to, to the scope of this discussion is uh, we started a campaign on, on looking to retrofit homes. So uh, building houses is great, but uh, in every city, um, new houses are going to represent a fairly small proportion of any future housing stock. We have a huge number of houses that are already built, particularly in, in a city like Coventry, where we've got a lot of houses from the 60s that were rebuilt after the war uh, and the 50s. Um, and we've got a lot of houses from the turn of the century, from the sort of 1900s. Um, that neither of which were built to very high uh, building standards, um, but which can be retrofitted very simply, particularly in, in a lot of the high density areas where you've got a lot of identical terraced houses. I mean, I've lived in three houses that are pretty much identical um, that you can retrofit quite easily. So what we're, we're looking to, to push the, the council and to push the government and, and, and to maybe push within a, a, a co-op structure or something, we're still working out exactly the structure of that is, is to do retrofit because if you put the burden of retrofit on the individual homeowner it's very very expensive and there's very little leverage um if you're a renter to do that on your landlord These conservatives have often put forward basically grants to landlords um to improve their asset which seems like a, a poor way of doing it um and certainly a less than just way of doing it um, so what we're proposing is that they go street by street um, similar to you do with utilities and essentially it becomes an opt-out and because you've got all the things done at once, um, you've got all that cost of the scaffolding and various other things um, that goes up per house, um, you can cut that cost um, really significantly. You can roughly cut it by uh, a factor of four, so it's a quarter of the price. Um, and that it then improves the housing, it uh, improves all the other outcomes that come with that and, and the Acorn guys were saying about you know health is housing. Um, and that, that comes from uh, Nipe Evan as well. Was it was the reason that uh, the housing uh, he was cabinet member for housing as well as uh, for health all those years ago. Um, it's, it's so important, and you get all these other benefits by combining it. And you can then, rather than having one heat pump per house, you can have one heat pump for five houses, and you have a slightly larger heat pump, but you're essentially flattening out that peak of, of heat demand. Um, and this is something which Liam Byrne really championed, and, and it's such a shame that he didn't um, become our, our mayor. But as our mayoral candidate, he really championed this. He had a policy of everyone being fed, healthy, and housed, um, which is such a low bar in such a developed country, but it's not one we're currently being met by our conservative government and conservative mayor, um, who is very much more focused on on the big, big boys' toys, the, the big infrastructure around this. But that housing infrastructure is so key to any... Uh, developments in this space because um, that's how you engage normal people. Things like uh, big transport infrastructure projects are really cool, but they're maybe only something you interface with if you actually need that specific piece of infrastructure. Um, and often they're ex expensive because, you know, public transport costs money at the moment and there's arguments around, obviously, should that be free, but let's put that aside. But um, housing is the, is the key thing that everyone interfaces with every day, um, ideally. Obviously, some homeless people don't, and, but everyone should be interfacing with that. Um, so we're working in, in, in Lower Stoke and another ward in, in Coventry Northwest, which I'm really sorry I've forgotten, but, but two wards uh, in Coventry, engaging with those communities uh, at the moment to understand where the best places to start are, um, ensuring uh, th those um, 
things are. We're, we're running a, a project with some the communities. So I think we've got a project in uh, a community centre um, to kind of get people to drop in to get their thoughts uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. I can't remember the exact date. Um, but if you want to get involved, if, if that um, housing campaign sounds like something you'd be interested in or the Unite uh, project working with the aerospace industry, um, please uh, get in touch. I think there's a link that's been sent out. If not, um, send us a, an email at commentarygreennewdeal at gmail.com and uh, it'll be really interesting uh, to have you guys involved. Thanks. Tom, thanks a lot. That's terrific. What we're going to do now is we're going to go to questions. Um, none of us predicted, and I regret this, but none of us predicted that Wales would be in the knockout round of the Euro matches uh, when we planned this. So we might be finishing just a little bit early to be able to see the match. Annabelle, are you of Welsh origin? I am indeed, yes. Yeah. I so thought you might be. I, I, I picked up the, the accent, so we might we might sneak off a bit early, Annabelle. Okay. All <laughs> right. Good. There's lots of questions coming in on the chat and all the rest. Um, there's also quite a bit of stick coming in as well, which I quite like. Uh, and one of them, hang on, where is it? I like this one. Where's it's Ray? Well, I've lost it now. I, I I don't mind addressing these things, and I don't. Mind, I we're always honest about what goes on. The Ray has come in just as a general political thing, because some people have been giving Starmer a bit of a hard time in the chat, which is fair enough. I understand that. But Ray has said, elect a leader worthy of the name Labour Party, and I'll rejoin and campaign. Ray, I don't think you've got the concept of democracy. We need your vote to be able to do that at some time in the future. And there's other people who quite rightfully said that Zara is going to be one of the, the future, one of the part of the leadership of the Labour Party in the future. And I agree, and I certainly hope so. So, Ray, if you want that, you need to be in the party to enable that to happen. <laughs> I'm a bit Leninist on this. I suggest you read Lenin's Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. It's quite a good little pamphlet. Anyway, I never thought I'd be quoting Lenin this afternoon. Let's just go to some of the questions that, that, have, that have come up. Um, Can I come in on that, John? Sorry. Oh, yeah, please do. A, a good analogy and one that I tried to pull out is that this sort of thing is often being pushed. Liam Byrne maybe wasn't the socialist counts candidate we wanted in Coventry. He was really good, and I backed him, but he backed the policies. And um, someone like Keir Starmer is a, maybe not the socialist we want, but he's the one that's better than the others. And he's going to bring in like a majority of the policies that we want. And sometimes it's better to go for the one that gets the most you can. Well, I, I, the, I, I always follow the Tony Benn line. It's the policies, not the personalities. So our campaign in this coming period, the real debate within the Labour Party in this coming period will not be about the individuals. It will be about the policies. And I think there is the strength within the movement and the creativity that we can create a climate of opinion that no on the, our policies is the point that Zara made more radical than even 2017, 2019. I think we can create that climate of opinion in the party, in the wider labour and trade union movement and in society overall that nobody can ignore, no labour leader either. And that's, I think that's the role that, that we've got to play. Interesting, I, Liam Byrne almost became a convert to our policies. It's just remarkable how much he signed up to. And there's a number like that. And I think it's because... The policies we advocated um, were the policies that were desperately needed for the time. Unfortunately, Brexit hit us in the 2019 election and never enabled us to develop them and then go into government with them. But that's part of the job that we've got now. I just want to come to Zara on all of this um, as well. On the Green New Deal issue, Zara, one of the battlegrounds that we're going to face, and we should be honest about this, is around the role of public ownership in the Green New Deal. I don't believe, and I still don't believe, that we'll be able to tackle climate change on the basis of the role of the private sector. There's a lot of greenwashing going on at the moment by big companies and corporations trying to reveal sort of green credentials. I'm skeptical about that naturally because I think the profit motive will override anything that they seek to do in terms of beneficial 
um, policy development with regard to climate change. So therefore, the role of the state is absolutely key. But it's trying to explain to people that the role of the state is in many forms. It could be the encouragement of cooperative development. It could be in, in terms of workers' control of developments. But in terms of Coventry, it's a lot about community control as well, where the state resources the local community to develop their local green networks. That's the battleground, isn't agree. it, public ownership? I absolutely agree. And it's something that I think we need to be explaining to people better on the doorstep and in conversations. But just talking about um, the way the private sector greenwashes, um, something that I've come across in Science and Technology Select Committee is the government's preferred candidate to be the next chair of UKRI. So UKRI, UK Research, and um, I believe it's Innovation, um, is the largest public body providing funding for research. And the government's prefer preferred candidate for that currently sits as chair of Shell and he's not planning on leaving that role um, and he's obviously uh, by the Companies Act um, responsible for promoting the interests of Shell and he doesn't think that there's a conflict of interest in also um, being uh, the, the chair essentially of UKRI and we see how uh, the private sector um, continuously is uh, taking up this space within um, our, our, even you know within government and is going to be able to um, fund so much research potentially uh, which could be very very problematic so I think we see it in so many different ways from the fact that you know uh, fossil fuel lobbyists have been um, trying to undermine climate activism and the, the science for decades and now they you know talk about their targets as though they are fully on board but even we know that actually the targets for 2050 um, are death sentence to so many and we need to be um, really scaling up what we're doing so we need to take control of government uh, we need to have that large-scale investment um, in our communities but also public ownership and I think what you were talking about when it comes to co-ops I think um, there are other places in the Midlands where there's quite a large co-op kind of community. And I think co-ops are definitely um, within the ecology of what's happening in Coventry, but this is something that we can definitely support. And I think the local council can be doing more um, supporting those as well. Um, there's a lot of empty buildings and so forth in the city centre and so many high streets across the city in Coventry as well. And I think when we look at rent and when we look at who, who space and we look at who is able to access um, some of that there are huge conversations and I think there is a lot more to be done in, in, in many ways on that. Tom just to build on that uh, my view at the moment is uh, there are a number of levels upon which we have to work global um, and that's to do with ensuring we're sharing technology we're reforming revolutionizing really the international finance sector in particular and Part of that is about reparations as well. But I also think actually the most important work is done at the local level. You've demonstrated a lot of that. What if we were arguing for something in our discussions in this next few months around Labour's policy review, what would be one of the most effective things that we could argue for to reinforce the work that you're doing at the local level? I think one thing is a challenge. Um, <laughs> okay, give me two. <laughs> the, the thing with the climate climate emergency is obviously that you know we need to do a lot quickly. Um, I think probably something like more local control um, and more. F I mean, the two things are always more money is always the answer, um, and more money for um, people to use in a sensible and localized way, money that is administered from central government is, or, or even you know, more widely, um, central government funding is always harder to spend. Um, and even at a regional level with West Midlands combined authority, sort of, you know, combined authorities, Metro mayors, those sorts of things, the more centralized the power is and, and the more centralized it is, particularly in one person, um, the harder that is to spend. So. I think just, just distributing more money uh, more widely. I think Coventry is a really good example. Our budget as a council has uh, roughly been halved since 2010. And I think if you were to ask anyone, which, which essentially means there is no money for discretionary spend, any discretionary spend has to come from a central, central, essentially central government money. If there's not a central government targeted 
pot of money. There just isn't any funding for it, anything um, to the extent that, you know, key important local services have, have been cut to the bone. Um, so they're not going to spend on, on what they see as a discretionary spend. And I think that's the key thing is yeah. more money at a more local level is, is the key thing. I'm, my background is local government, um, both in terms of being elected councillor on the GLC and chair of its finance, but also as a, a chief executive of a local government association. When I was shadow um, chancellor and I'd have meetings in the city of London and anyone raised the GLC with me, I'd always say to them, if it wasn't for the GLC, we'd be swimming at the moment because it was the GLC that built the Thames barrier which was our planning for the longer term because of what we saw then, even then, as some of the environmental issues that we'd be facing as a result of increased flooding. And it saddens me really, because in those days, it was like the halcyon days. I had, as chair of finance, I could raise the level of rates to whatever I needed. I could also ensure there was capital resources through a money bill in parliament. And we, we invested for the long term. That's one of the reasons why Mrs. Thatcher abolished us, basically. And I agree with you, actually, restoring money to local communities is absolutely key. On the housing front, Annabelle, Jamie Brownwell's um, put in the chat. I don't know whether you know Jamie. He's a Unite Trade Union. He's brilliant, absolutely really brilliant activist, experienced, absolutely committed. Plus, he's a good guitar player, by the way, as well. And his singing is not bad, too, I'll tell you. He's part of a group. But he put in there this issue is, yeah, let's build the homes, but we can only build them if we've got a well-resourced, properly paid, properly trade unionised workforce. How has ACORN linked up with the union movement? So ACORN itself, while we are a union um just to refer to another question we're not uh tuc affiliated yeah. um and this is because if we were it would kind of it would restrict what we are and aren't allowed to do and it would prevent us from taking a lot of um using a lot of methods and doing certain direct actions um to answer the question about how we work with other unions so we are non-partisan and we don't have, uh, we get involved with a lot of groups like Claim the Future, um, but we don't have strict ties. A lot of our members are in other unions. And I think one thing that ACON is very good at, um, like you said earlier, we give people a lot of confidence and we, uh, we really try and empower people to see the value in their communities and the value of collectivizing. Um, so as a result of that, I would say that, uh, Acorn does a good job of showing the value of a union, one for your community and two for your workplace. Um, and we do encourage, as much as we can, we encourage our members to, to be collective. Um, and that often translates to, to unionising in the workplace. Second point, evictions. What's happening at the moment in terms of the legislation and the what's happening through the courts at the moment with the lifting of the ban eventually um i have to be honest i've been quite busy recently um and have managed to keep on top of that but one thing that acorn has done before um the eviction ban and is really kick-starting uh well has been kick-starting for the last few months i know the ban got extended um as far as i'm aware it ends at the end of this month but i might be wrong um and we have groups so the acorn groups across the country all have these eviction resistance networks so it's a group of um not just acorn members anyone can take part in our eviction resistance training and join our network um and we work kind of very quickly to keep people in their homes so if um if you know someone who is being evicted um often unfairly, uh, evictions are the number one cause. Unfair evictions and no fault evictions are the number one cause of homelessness in the UK. So if you know anyone, tell them to get in touch with ACORN and we'll do what we can to, to keep them in their home. Thanks, Annabelle. Final questions and then we can go off and hopefully watch Wales beat 
then mark and get through to the next stages okay um just the selection of them really a lot of this is to be honest a lot of the chat that's coming as well as sort of internal labor party stuff about Keir Starmer, etc which are, again it's part of the debate that we need to have and we'll respond as, as best we can but part of it as well is about what in these difficult circumstances now how do we move things forward one of the issues Zara, is how do we hold this government to account what do you feel i know your interventions have been parliament have been fantastic but where do you think we go from here now in holding this government to account I think this government just needs um, a strong opposition. And I think that um, that's not a strong opposition just in the chamber. I think we definitely need to be up in our game in that sense. And it's not about following what policy, you know, think tanks or focus groups are saying. It's about following our principles and knowing that standing up to what they are doing, whether it's dodgy COVID contracts or whether it's the failure of the privatized test and trace system, we need to be calling these things out and not, you know, waiting for there to be some kind of uh, poll that tells us that, you know, the public back it, we know what's right. So I think we need strong opposition in the chain, but also presence within movement uh, and in the streets. So we've seen just how important kill the bill um, protests were, which were led by groups like Sisters Uncut, and how they actually forced the front bench to change their position. I know me and you, John, we were going to vote against the bill anyway, but it was that presence in the streets. It was women who were angered at the way that they were treated when they were attending a vigil for Sarah Everard, who really forced us um, as a party to take the right position. Um, when I think about the People's Assembly demonstration today, it brought together people who care about Black Lives Matter, who care about injustice in Palestine and elsewhere internationally, people who care about trans rights, people who are calling for there to be real action on the climate emergency. All of these movements are coming together that's what inspires me and that's where again we are showing how we can come together so i think it's about knowing that we need strong movements and we like to need strong opposition within parliament and and working together to hold this government to account um there is so much pressure now on boris johnson to sack matt hancock but we know that you know the problems don't just end with matt hancock the problems are with boris johnson they're with Preeti patel they're with the entire government but we need to build on that we need to be speaking up um, we need to be defending things like, you know, when, when MPs talk about social care and they say, actually, it's too ambitious to say it should be free at the point of use. Challenging that and showing that actually um, we can we can get these things that we deserve and we can fund them uh, by going for people who are who have the, the biggest shoulders um, in society. And I think if we don't do that, then as we see a greater fallout from the pandemic in terms of job losses in terms of um you know uh, people losing their livelihoods and so forth then um it will be too late by then it's interesting that one of the issues that's come up in the chat um and i'll come on to you tom now on this is around free broadband when we launched that i know we've been criticized for it but actually it was one of those things that uh, was late in the day in terms of the general election campaign but that was because Actually, it's one of those policies that we were preparing for the prospect of a general election in 2020, 2022, that sort of thing, because we weren't expecting to go in 2019, but we did because of Brexit. We were forced into it. But the free broadband, actually, when we launched it, no matter what people say now, was incredibly popular in the polling. And it was incredibly popular, um, particularly for, for younger people. But actually now it's quite interesting how popular it is across all generations. But Joe has put in the, actually has put in the chat as well, about are we thinking of in extending that to other forms of, well, I suppose universal basic services would call them. One of them he's mentioned is public transport. Actually, we were considering at one point in the development of our policies, how we could not just reduce the cost of public transport but eventually arriving at a free system because we thought that was one of the main ways in which we would take people out of their cars where do we go from here on transport initially tom have we lost tom sorry i was on mute um <laughs> uh, on transport i think um i think 
definitely the, the cost of public transport is far too high. But I think potentially an entirely free system is, uh, there are challenges around it. You look at the only country in the world that does it, which is Luxembourg. Luxembourg has one of the highest um, use of cars. It's not, and there are other reasons for that as well, but it has a, a pretty comprehensive public transport system and yet it's not used by the majority of people. Um, I don't necessarily think a free public transport, un universal basic services, I think there is a very strong argument for. I think an entirely free public transport system is perhaps a, a challenge. Within Coventry, we've got um, very light rail. I think it, le it leads to a lack of investment. But uh, when you look at, um, I, I grew up on the Somerset levels um, years ago, and I had to cycle five miles every day to get the bus to college, which then took an hour and a half. And there were friends at college who had to drop out of college because they simply couldn't get to college because um, the bus service was, was cancelled halfway through. And, and a lot of those bus services were subsidised, not actually subsidised very much. So I think there was one to Clumpton that was subsidised 5%, but the council pulled the subsidy or, or the, pulled the subsidy because they'd had their central government um, money that essentially funded that subsidy cut. So as part of the cuts, they had to make a different decision. And part of that is because it was a private company running it. So I think more important than free public transport is publicly owned and publicly run uh, public transport, similar to initially similar to what they've got in Manchester and London, is is where it's essentially set by a nominally government body, and uh, it, similarly in uh, Nottingham, um, which it has been shown to be so so good. And then um, essentially beyond that, publicly owned um, services, so you can cross subsidise them more e easily, um, but that's currently illegal. So a big part of the the thing is is changing the law, um, and, and there are really good campaigns because, because that's popular. Uh, similarly, around railway stations, you know, I, I grew up 45 miles and uh, 45 minutes away from a, bus, a railway station, but there was a railway line that ran like half a mile behind um, where I lived. And it's those sorts of things. It's just put slightly more railway stations. A lot of the infrastructure exists. Um, and just in, improving the, the that sort of stuff is it, not, I think, Almost it's a distraction sometimes to talk about free public transport, which has some benefits and some disbenefits. But when you look at the sort of social apparatus around that, that you really need to do that, um, we have all the technology. Pretty much for all of the decarbonisation stuff, I'm, my, I'm an engineer. Um, I've worked on this for a long time on, on, on a sustainability engineer. The technology exists to get to net zero today. It's just about implementing it. And I think part of that implementation is accelerated through greater public control um, rather than maybe saying it should be free because if it's free, it tends to get abused and uh, there is a harder investment model for it. Um, and definitely public transport should be cheaper. It should be subsidized. I'm not necessarily sure it should be subsidized to the point of being zero. Um, mm. It's an ambition for the future, but I agree the the small steps by way of reducing cost of transport is so effective. In London, it's been remarkably effective in, sh in shifting um, people from their cars and onto buses and tubes. The problem there then becomes capacity. Final point to you, Annabelle, so we can go off and watch the football. Um, what do you want people to do now? Join ACORN, support ACORN. How do they do it? Yeah, um, so I'll get it sent to the the chat. Um, we'd love people to join ACORN. Um, so I, as I did mention, uh, we're a membership organisation. We're a dues-paying membership organisation, but we work on a, uh, a relative scale. So we have uh, everything from, well, essentially it's either unwaged or student um, dues, which are three pounds a month. Otherwise, we ask for um, one hour's uh, pay, one hour's wage, whatever that is for you, um, to make it as as fair and equitable as possible. Um, we've got a lot of information on our website. I'm just trying to find the link. There we go. Um, but yeah, we'd love people to join ACORN, support ACORN, um, follow us on social media, find your local ACORN group. Um, if you 
don't have a local ACON group, um, there might be one in your nearest city. You can set one up yourself. You can get involved with our campaigns locally or online. Um, and just really get involved with other groups. Um, get involved in your community. Take direct action on things that concern you, whether it's housing or uh, transport. Um, policy, anything, um, and really kind of look for that value in your community. And if it's not there, then then try and create it. Thanks, Annabelle. Great. One group I forgot to mention, and they're in the chat as well. Again, I was at the foundation of this group all those years ago. It's been one of the most effective campaigning organisations, which is DPAC. And we never had a disability movement for a long period of time in this country, and DPAC came together and proved to be incredibly effective. Final point from me. Thanks, Annabelle. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Zara, of course. Thanks for hosting this in, in, with regard to the Coventry constituency. Final point from me is this. I just want to come back to this issue about the Labour Party policy review. Um, whether you're in the Labour Party or whether you've dropped out or you have never joined, you're still part of this discussion and it's absolutely key. What's going to happen over this next 12 months is uh, the Labour Party Policy Review will hopefully be engaging as widely as possible with people about their ideas about well, and their analysis of our society at the moment and what's needed and the policies that we need for the long-term future and the policies that should go into that manifesto. Now, I'm hoping that's an open and democratic process. We've got to make it an open and democratic process, but the best way of doing that is whether you're in the Labour Party or not, is Judix get involved in one of these discussions. But we want to, the best way of getting making sure that a policy is adopted is making sure there's a, a campaign alongside that policy, not just an intellectual debate, but a campaign. So what we want to do is create such a climate of opinion around a host of radical policies that nobody can ignore them. And people recognize if they want to get elected next time, these are the sort of policies that they have to adopt. I think that's possible, but it requires an awful lot of hard work and again, I just say to people, look, whether you're in the party, I want you to be in the Labour Party, but if you're not, still participate, still get involved, because whether it comes to an intellectual debate in the meeting, submission of a policy paper, or a form of direct action in associated with that policy campaign, it's important that we work together in solidarity. And that's what these discussions have all been about, building solidarity. So thanks a lot for all of those who participated. And... Um, See you on the streets in the campaigns for the future. Solidarity. Thank you. We need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future. <laughs>